everyone, and welcome. I'm James Milan. This is our series on the ABCs of LGBTQ+. And I'm joined in our studio today by two guests who I'm going to ask to introduce themselves. I'm going to give you their names. Uh, Andy Rubinson is on the far side, and Valerie Overton is right here. But tell us uh, uh, a little bit, just briefly, about what you do and what organizations you represent. Great. Yeah, I'm Andy Rubinson, a resident of Arlington and a commissioner on Arlington's Rainbow Commission. I uh, also have past experience uh, as a member of the local steering committee for the Human Rights Campaign as well as the International Board of Governors. Great. And I'm Valerie Overton. My pronouns are she, her. I'm co-chair of Lex Pride, which is an organization in Lexington that works to uh, advance social justice for LGBTQ people and all people. And I've also been an activist for civil rights and social justice for about 50 years. All right. Well, you just mentioned social justice, Valerie, and that's perfect because our topic for today is advancing social justice, um, you know, within the realm of the of LGBTQ life and right and 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 rights. Um, so. Uh, I'd like to start by first identifying the kinds of areas we, in another uh, segment in this series, we, we talked about the legal aspects mm -hmm. uh, uh, and legal protections against discrimination. But I'd like to, to dig down a little bit more into you know, the everyday lived experience of uh, people within the LGBTQ plus community and what kinds of, uh, of discrimination, of uh, of hostility, uh, of perhaps even oppression, um, are experienced on a day-to-day -day basis in, in what context? Mm -hmm. So feel free, either one of you, to jump in to, to identify that. Well, it's maybe focusing on, on, on the positives, like what are ways that we can do to make things more inclusive? So yes, there, there is a lot of discrimination, but it's, it's things like how do we make our, our schools safer? How do we make our communities more welcoming? Which Lex Pride and the Arlington Rainbow Commission, are kind of our, our goal is, is to do that, to make people feel um, that they have a place and they're, they're welcome in our communities. Um, things like uh, families and being able to, to adopt children, have recognition of the, the, the family units and, and spousal uh, relationships for um, people seeking medical care. So there, there are things like, like that that, you know, still have a ways to, to go, I, I think. Um, you know, society has to, to kind of um, grow more into that. <laughs> Right, exactly. I think that, you know, there are issues both at the systemic level, you know, in terms of uh, agencies and schools and uh, the, the policies around families and so forth. And then, you know, you think about the interpersonal and the community level as well. And so, for example, you know, when you are um, gender non-binary and there are no restrooms that are all gender, um, or when people, you know, when you maybe go to the gardening club, right, and people assume that you're heterosexual and that you have an opposite sex spouse, um, and so forth. You know, there are just ways of becoming more welcoming by thinking about your assumptions, the assumptions that you make about someone's sexual orientation and gender identity, and kind of checking those so that the language that you use and um, the questions that you ask and the programming that you offer, whether that's films and books and things like are, are those reflecting the full diversity our, of our community rather than a more narrow uh, look at our community. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of ways kind of at the interpersonal and community levels as well as kind of the systemic levels which are super important because they do affect people's everyday lives. Yeah, and, and I think it's kind of ingraining these practices. It's funny, um, yesterday I, I got a, I sent out a work email, and I have my pronouns that he mm has -hmm. um, pronouns in my email. And this was actually somebody that um, lives in France, and they're like, "Andy, what does this mean?" <laughs> he, and so it's it's yeah. even just creating kind of a, a social norm mm -hmm. for things where you know gender neutral restrooms, the use use of pronouns and sharing, and, and by getting everyone to, to share this and use it, it becomes commonplace because then 
it's not putting people in as, an awkward position of, of having to, it's like, why is this person sharing their pronouns with me? It's like, no, that's just how you do it. Mm -hmm. right. right, normalizing all yeah. of this stuff is really one of the goals for advancing social justice, it seems to, for sure. I'm glad you mentioned the word assumptions, um, mm -hmm. Val, because I think that, uh, that that's a place where we all can do a lot more work. I think one of the things I'm always struck by when it comes to uh, the LGBTQ community as a vulnerable community in the same way as others might be, uh, it's, it's just so much less visible a lot of the times for people uh, that you are carrying this as part of your identity mm -hmm. around with you through the world. I'm wondering if you, find, you know, what you guys have noted around assumptions that people make when again a, a per, perhaps a difference or at least a, a distinction about somebody else is not is not kind of readily uh, visible or perceptible. Right. So we hear a lot. Um, I mean, I, th I think that there's both, as you were talking about the systemic level and the kind of interpersonal level, you know, for example, in schools and in other settings, you know, sometimes people, uh, whether it's educators or employers or whatever, use kind of the legal name that's on the birth certificate and those pronouns rather than the, your preferred name and pronouns. And that is, you know, very the opposite of affirming, shall we say, <laughs> the opposite of welcoming. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and in, in, uh, in a workplace, for example, like for, for some of us, it can be difficult either internally or with clients to say, well, you know, it's okay for my colleague to talk about the barbecue that they went to with their husband, but is it okay for me to talk about, um, you know, with my partner what we have done and uh, over the weekend, and or is that going to be considered like you know flaunting mm -hmm. <laughs> one's sexuality? Yeah, too much information. Mm -hmm. Too much information. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge disconnect between what is oh, acceptable for heterosexual people to talk about and what is acceptable for LGBTQ people to talk about. And do you think that the onus, for instance, uh, let's just let's pose a hypothetical situation where I'm meeting a new person mm -hmm. um, and I'm a heterosexual man, um, I don't know how this person identifies him or herself or their selves. Um, is the, should the onus be on me to seek to find that out? Um, or is the onus on that person, say it, sh he or she is a member of the LGBTQ community who goes by certain pronouns, should the onus be on that person to make that clear right from the outset? How, 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 how you know, I know we're really kind of digging into, <laughs> yeah. the, into, the, into the weeds here, but how does that, how does that work? I, I mean, I think it, people vary, you know, they're very different. So some people are very forthcoming and, and some people, you know, it's a, it's a journey through time. I know I've, you know, over time become much more comfortable, you know, talking about, you know, oh, my husband or things of, of that nature. Um, but, you know, I think the, the, the key thing is kind of try to reduce your presumptions. Like when you are asking somebody, you know, you talk about the, oh, is your spouse or, you know, the, so, so don't, don't presume that like, oh, you must be, like I see you have a wedding ring on, you must be married to a, to a woman. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think that you'll often hear some terminology that, that's recently become more prevalent is like cis, is, mm -hmm. is like appearing to be kind of like the, the norm of, of what you would expect a typical male to be. And it, not everyone is that way. And it's kind of the realization that there are folks that are gender non-binary or people that that um, are just don't don't have that that cis appearance and you have to just be considerate of, of them so it's using consideration and also being a, a little more broad and, and opening to other things other than your norm exactly yeah and I think with pronouns in particular um, and gender identity in particular I think you're right that that is an area that can be really confusing for a lot of people and so I, I think it really depends on uh, context. So if you're just meeting someone in passing, 
you might not need to say, you know, uh, you know, I'm Valerie, my pronouns are she, her, you know, who are you kind of thing. Um, it depends on kind of context and relationship. Mm -hmm. And so if it's a situation where that understanding and uh, the relationship is one where you want to kind of be respectful of that information, you know, one way to do that is just to model using your own pronouns so that if someone else wants to share that information, they can, but not pushing it, mm -hmm. right? So you don't want to insist that someone share that information with you if they don't want to. Right. Uh, well, it's interesting, I have to say, that, um, you know, speaking again as somebody who is very support, you know, wants to do the right thing mm -hmm. in these situations, um, I uh, will work and have been working and not to make presumptions or assumptions about somebody else in the way that he or she might identify themselves. Um, <clears throat> I also would never think in a, that to exchange that. In other mm -hmm. words, if you were to introduce yourself to me, I'm Valerie, my pronouns are she, her, I don't think to myself, oh, okay, so I'm James and I'm he, him. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't do that, you know? Um, should I? I guess. Do, do you think that that would ease, you know, if I, again, if I'm trying hard um, to, to be a good person in these interactions, is that something that, that would ease that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, as you said, trying to make things more the normal uh, thing, thing to do, uh, I think it also depends a little bit on, on the environment you're, mm -hmm. you're in. You know, mm -hmm. so we, uh, we always open with, with our pronouns, um, but it's not something that I'm necessarily, like when, when we've introduced our, ourselves uh, for, for this segment, you know, I, I don't automatically think to do it, but I've automatically added to my email. So, so it, it's something that I need to build on too. So it's, you know, don't, don't feel that. We're all working on it. We're all working on it. Right, right. It's, it's, a, it's a journey um, to, to be doing that. And, and I should be making that more the, the norm, um, especially in situations like these. Yeah, I, I think that, um, again, it depends on context. If it's a situation where you want to learn more about someone, then I think that offering your pronouns is helpful. Um, or if it's a situation where perhaps you're in a meeting and people, everybody's introducing themselves. I think that's a situation where it would be good for all of us to get into the habit of introducing ourselves with pronouns. And it does take practice. It feels very awkward at first for most people. Um, but once you get into the swing of, of using your pronouns for introductions, it really does become easier. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I, I think that sometimes what we, what I like to say is, you know, embrace the uncomfortable. You know, sometimes things are awkward or uncomfortable at first, and that's okay. It doesn't, we don't have to start out feeling comfortable and easy with all of these things. It's just a matter of, you know, working on it. Mm -hmm. But but being even like being engaged with with someone where you do ask about a spouse versus a husband or wife yes. makes just just seeing your awareness that like this is I, I I'm not being specific makes it feel more comfortable for that person to be able to say oh it's actually my husband right and I do think that that is something um, that regardless of the context I do think that using non gendered language to refer to people's spouses or families or friends and those kinds of things uh, signifies that you're not making assumptions. So, you know, even who's in your family is really different from like, so who's your wife and you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So clearly avoiding presumptions and assumptions, uh, being open to um, again, what what kind of language will make the other person comfortable in terms of however uh, much they want to reveal about themselves and their situation? These are keys. Yeah, and, and I think that you know, some one thing that's helpful for uh, to recognize also is that people vary a lot in their gender expression. So, for example, you know, sometimes. Historically, like the stereotype of a lesbian has been kind of the butch, 
you know, <laughs> um, more masculine presenting woman. And that's true in some cases and not in other cases. And likewise, you know, if you're cisgender, your gender expression can be anywhere on the spectrum. And if you're transgender, your gender expression can be anywhere on the spectrum. Um, and so I think that's another area where not making assumptions and recognizing that that might vary by person, whether or not you're a cisgender or transgender, and also by culture. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to recognize that gender expression and other kinds of identity look, can look different um, based on your cultural background. Um, I just wanted, before we wrap things up, I wanted to make sure that on the topic of advancing social justice for LGBTQ people, um, that we haven't left anything unsaid that needs to be said. So I just wanted to invite you in an open way uh, to add anything in that we haven't covered. Well, you know, one, th one thing I'd like to say, and a little, little uh, call out to the Rainbow Commission is, you know, the, the whole purpose of having um, the Arlington Rainbow Commission is to create a more welcoming community. So we're able to do things like hold uh, a pride event and um, other community events. Tonight we're doing karaoke and uh, Coco right. at the, um, the Senior Center. But we, ha we have ongoing events. We have craft stays and things where we'll, we bring um, people of all ages together to, to do things. And just it's kind of creating that community and making people know that they are welcome. So, so I think that's one, one important thing that, that we can do as a community to kind of support one another. Yeah, I think that's really important. And I think that a lot of these events, you don't have to be LGBTQ to go to them. It's like allies. We love our allies, right? <laughs> and so bringing people together is really important. And also whether it's through the Arlington Rainbow Commission or through Lex Pride, um, there are a lot of resources available. So you can look on our websites for uh, resources. And we also offer um, educational events, awareness events, uh, trainings, either for general audiences or for professional development uh, workshops on these topics. Um, and also, you know, there are things like book lists and movie lists and things like that, so that if you are someone who's working in a community organization who has these kinds of offerings, just to remember to kind of try to be inclusive in your offerings. Mm -hmm. And I love the, the, the fact that you've both described the organizations that you work with primarily as inclusive, that you, mm -hmm. as you say, love your allies, et cetera, because uh, as we well know, uh, people's identities partake of many different mm -hmm. uh, facets. Sure. Absolutely. And one's sexual orientation, one's gender identity, and you know, many other things go into that. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing, you know, nobody wants to be identified only by one of the things that they, that they, uh, that is true about themselves. Exactly. So, um, all right, well, thank you very much for the work that you do, and thanks also for uh, sharing your, your, your knowledge, your expertise, your understanding and compassion with us today. My pleasure. Okay, thank you. Um, for Andy Rubinson and Valerie Overton, I'm James Milan. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time.